welcome everyone. We're going to get started. Um, welcome to Emissions Impossible. This is a webinar sponsored by the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy and Grain. IATP works locally and globally for fair and sustainable food, farm, and trade systems. Grain works to support small farmers and social movements and their struggles for community controlled and biodiversity based food systems. Uh, my name is Ben Lilliston. I'm the Director of Rural Strategies and Climate Change at ITP. Uh, first, some quick housekeeping. If you're not familiar with Zoom, I'd like to draw your attention to the Zoom webinar control panel. If you put your cursor towards the bottom of your screen, um, you will see a number of things kind of pop up there. You'll have uh, participants, Q&A, share, chat, record. What you want to click on is Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout this uh, presentation, don't go into the chat for that. Go into the Q&A. It's the easiest way for us to sort. And just if anything comes to mind as we're going through this, just go ahead and put it in there. We'll get to as many questions as we can uh, at the end of this uh, or even throughout if it seems like it fits right in with the conversation. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded and will be available at IETP's website uh, and we'll send a link to all participants once it's completed. So let's get started. Uh, this past weekend, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a new report focused on pathways to keep the planet from warming 1.5 degrees. The report concluded that to prevent a 1.5 degree warm up and the enormous associated damage requires, quote, rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society, unquote. Most of the focus in addressing climate change has rightfully been on carbon emissions from the fossil fuel industry, but the IPCC report also highlights other sources of emissions, including those associated with the rapidly growing global meat and dairy industry. This past summer, IATP and Grain reported on the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the 35 largest companies in this booming sector. As part of that report, we dug into what these meat and dairy companies are saying about climate change and how they are responding to growing criticism about their emissions. So today we'll hear from the report's lead authors, Shafali Sharma and Devlin Kuyek who will walk us through the key findings of that report and answer questions about how these companies are responding to criticisms around their emissions and what a pathway to a 1.5 degrees looks like for this particular sector. Uh, Shafali is the director of IATP's European office in Berlin. Her current work focuses on, excuse me, the economic, social, and environmental impacts of the global meat industry. She continues to examine how international trade rules and global governance on food security and climate intersect with this sector. Devlin is Grain's most active researcher, focusing on monitoring and analyzing global agribusiness, including the global land rush. Devlin is based in Montreal and spends time supporting partners and staff in other regions around the world. So let's get to Shafali and Devlin, and I'll start with asking uh, Shafali and you guys, why did you start looking at the meat and dairy industry and its role in greenhouse gas emissions? Thanks, Ben. Um, it's um, for some time now, uh, we've been looking at the social and environmental impacts of a rapidly growing global meat industry and how rapidly it's consolidated. And um, while it took off, uh, while this consolidation really actually um, started to take place in the 80s, it uh, really accelerated in the 90s. Um, my thing is frozen. <laughs> Um, and I wanted to show this particular chart uh, that kind of shows the acceleration. And you can see in the from 2000, 2010 and going reaching up to where we are now, the growth in production has really exploded. Um, and it wasn't until uh, the livestock's long shadow came out in 2006, which is that uh, line right here, the pink line, which is showing the dairy production. Uh, that an official link was made between the impacts of climate change and the livestock sector. And you can see from these two slides how much um, the, the production and consumption growths, the, even though they're different data sets, kind of um, line up and show the consistent growth that has just exploded in the last several decades. Um, and unfortunately, the focus has not been on um, 
actually reducing absolute emissions, but rather looking at how can this industry reduce emissions per kilo of milk or meat produced. And so we find ourselves in a situation today where we are emitting 51 gigatons. The meat industry is in that yellow with 7.14 gigatons. And we are supposed to make a drastic cut for all sectors of the economy to 13 gigatons. If we want to get to the 1.5 degree, which we now know from the IPCC report is essential for human life and for food production itself. And if we were to do nothing, if all other sectors were to act um, today and the livestock sector continued to just go on in its own path as it has been doing, then what we'd see is that the livestock sector alone would contribute to us to runaway climate change. And that's a real problem. And I think this is one of the main reasons we've focused on who, why um, this issue is so critical and the industry, why the industry is so important in this equation and, and the regulations for this industry. So in looking at this industry, what companies are there, or what countries are they really focused in? What countries did you look at most closely? So we zoomed in pretty easily to a handful of countries. Um, this chart here shows uh, just in terms of beef, pork, and chicken production and exports that it's mainly six countries in the EU that are uh, responsible for the lion's share of rising uh, meat production and exports. So you can see that six countries um, produce, you know, more close to 70% of the beef in this uh, globally. Um, they produce close to half of the, they export close to half of the total production. Uh, th only three countries uh, export close to half of um, all of the production. Uh, in, in pork, it's even more concentrated. Three countries uh, are responsible for 80% of the production and four countries are responsible for 90% of the exports. So you can see um, that it's really, um, a handful of governments who really we need to address this problem with and these uh, countries are the same countries that also have a high per capita consumption so both production exports and consumption are much higher in these countries um, this is what we in our report mentioned as surplus countries uh, surplus protein countries plus china um, because China still on a per capita basis is, is lower compared to many of these other countries. Shifali, can you go back to the slide? Just uh, one, back one slide, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Just want to make sure people understand this. So we, we have, um, we did calculations to try to look at the emissions from meat and dairy production. Uh, currently, and then based on the FAO's, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization's projections into the future for meat and dairy consumption. And as Shivali was saying, if you look at those in 2030, you see that the meat and dairy production would take up 27% of the overall emissions that would be allowable under a scenario of uh, achieving only a 1.5 degree increase in global temperatures. And the IPCC report, which Ben was highlighting, the most recent one, was pointing out how disastrous things would be if temperatures rise over that number. So if we are serious about reducing emissions by 2050, in line with that, there is absolutely no way that that can happen without a drastic redu reduction in meat and dairy production. If you look at the 2050, which is the last two bars there, you see that it would account for, the, on, on current uh, projections, that would mean meat and dairy production would account for 81% of the allowable global greenhouse gas emissions, which is completely impossible. And then on the next slide, which Shavali is showing, and just to reiterate, because I think what you're saying, Shavali, is super important here, there's a very small number of countries that are responsible for the lion's share of that production. So all, much of those, re those reduction emissions have to happen. In, in these countries, just to just to reemphasize that, Shabal, thanks. And uh, I just want to underline that currently the global discourse around climate mitigation, particularly on livestock, is centered around emissions intensity, which is what I mentioned earlier, which is about um, reducing emissions per kilo 
of milk or kilo of meat. And that means that the focus shifts towards the less efficient uh, producers in Africa or Latin America, that they're very inefficient at producing. But what we're trying to show with something like this is actually, this is where the massive numbers of animals are being processed um, and produced. And this is where the bulk of the climate emissions are coming from. Um, and we'll get to that uh, in the course of this, but I wanted to flag this early on. Okay, and so given these countries as a, as a main focus, what companies did you dig into? What companies were you looking at? Well, there, you know, there's no coincidence that the, uh, Sherlock, can you go to the map, the, the global map? Yep, trying. <laughs> okay, well, when that slide comes up, what you'll see is that we, and we looked at the, the top companies from each sector. So from beef, pork, poultry, and dairy, you know, where most of the emissions are concentrated. And we looked at the top uh, 10 companies from each. You get 35 companies overall because uh, some of those companies are, are within the top 10 in, in multiple sectors. Uh, and these companies have their production bases in these countries of what we can call sort of surplus production or you know, JBS, the, the largest meat company in the world calls these countries the uh, protein surplus countries. Um, and that's where these companies have their, their base of operations. That's where they have developed over the last decades these massive, uh, uh, what you might call export processing zones for uh, the overproduction of, of, uh, of meat and dairy and its uh, export to the, to the rest of the world. Um, and so we, we wanted to get a sense of not just the footprint of these countries, but the, of the companies that, that control the production, which are in a sense, uh, I mean, from, from the farm to, uh, to the export shifts, these are, these are the companies that really control and dictate uh, production. So we wanted to get a sense of what their emissions are. And there's very little um, information. You, you, you won't find the, uh, the full scale uh, calculations of emissions with, for many of these companies, most of these companies, in fact. So we had to uh, see if we could calculate them ourselves. So what we did was we, we looked at their, their, the volumes of production. Uh, we also were able to uh, get a fairly good sense of where that production was taking place. And then we used the latest metrics from the, uh, the FAO's GLEAM methodology. Now this is a methodology that was developed with um, the main lobby groups of these uh, companies. So, uh, you know, the, it would be hard for the industry to dispute our, our findings. And uh, we, using that, those metrics, we were able to calculate the, uh, the emissions from these top companies. And I think, it, it, you know, it should be fairly uh, shocking or eye-opening to people to, to, to see the, the, the scale of the emissions from each of these companies. We're more familiar, I think, with the um, uh, fossil fuel companies, you know, oil companies like Exxon and Shell and BP. But if you if you stack up the you know just the top five companies against these big fossil fuel producers, you see that there there are you know there are some uh, they're not so far off. In fact, the top, putting the top five companies together, as you can see in this chart here, um, it, you know the emissions are actually higher than those of Exxon Mobil. Shell and BP, and on a on a country level, if you go to the the next slide, is that possible? On a country level, you know, putting the, together the, the emissions just from the top twenty companies, uh, those emissions are higher than uh, than certain OECD countries. Overall emissions from those countries, such as uh, Germany, uh, Canada, Australia, UK, France, you know, much higher. <laughs> um, so. You know, these companies are really central uh, when we think about uh, the need to, to reduce emissions overall. So we are hearing a little bit more about the industry's uh, role in climate change. The IPCC report mentioned it, um, but I think shareholders are also asking about it. So what is the industry saying about this? How, how are they responding to growing scrutiny about their greenhouse gas emissions? So as part of the research for this report, we actually looked very in depth into 
each of these 35 companies to see whether any of them were actually um, you know, accounting for their emissions, were they reporting their emissions, were they setting any targets, did the targets, were they comparable to each other? And what we found was actually that uh, the bulk of these 35 were not reporting or under-reporting their emissions drastically, as we'll show you in the graphics. And um, not so many of them were setting targets. And if there were, there were a hodgepodge of different targets, different years, different baselines. So it's hard to even compare progress from one company to another. Um, out of all of the 35, I think there were four that we said actually had any kind of a credible reporting methodology. Um, but what we note is that even with those, uh, it's all voluntary. So it's completely to the discretion of these companies what they want to do with what they're finding. Um, so I want to move to this next slide, which shows um, that out of the 35, 16 were not reporting. Um, nine were only reporting a part of their emissions and not from their supply chain, which is where 80 to 90% of their emissions come from. And about 10 were reporting emissions from some parts of their supply chain and the, their operations, et cetera. Um, in terms of underreporting, I think this shows you very clearly the meat uh, uh, companies are in yellow in this bar. And um, you can see that so many of them are drastically underreporting, like JBS, uh, Marfrig. And then you can see also with the dairy companies in pink, our calculations are much higher than Fonterra's or Arla's, for instance. And let me see if this actually shows up. I like this GIF because it really shows concretely what we mean. I mean, JBS's emissions are actually 3% of what we actually calculated their emissions were. And so I think it's, um, you know, this is a, a real area that we found was important. Now, in terms of targets, as I said, uh, we had 35 meat and dairy corporations, uh, largest ones, 14 have reduction targets, and only six of them include the supply chain, so where the actual livestock is. So I think there's a long way to go where this industry is concerned in terms of being able to even get a grasp of really what their emissions are and what they're effectively going to do about it. Yeah, I mean, uh, Cargill uh, responded uh, just over the past couple of days uh, to the IPCC report by saying, you know, they were committed to uh, uh, reductions in their emissions in line with the, the Paris Agreement. But what, what they're not saying there is that that, that that doesn't include their supply chain. And what Jeff Holly is saying, they were 90% of their emissions are in cargo, admits that 90% of its emissions are there. And they only say that they will begin to consider you know, emissions from their supply chain and look at them more closely. Um, so they're, they're far, far away from where things really uh, would need to be if they were moving in any kind of serious direction. And there are a few companies that have done more in the way of reporting. Um, you know, Nestle, for instance, considers its uh, supply chain emissions in its calculations. It's a bit difficult to, to say, to, to, to compare those with our numbers because they, they don't, there's no transparency really on their, on their calculation. So you, you can't disaggregate the dairy data. Uh, with uh, Danone, which is another company that does <coughs> report, um, you know, it's full full scope emissions. Uh, it it's, it also has uh, set some pretty strong targets that included supply chain. the The problem we had with with what Danone was proposing is if you you look at this graph, this is taken from. Um, it's a graph uh, produced by, by Danone, we just reproduced it here. Uh, you look at this yellow line, that, that's, that's the do nothing line. And what that indicates is that Danone is expecting this, uh, that to, to represent its the growth in uh, sales uh, on overall uh, processing volumes uh, 
during that period, so from 2015 to 2030. So a, a, a really steep increase in growth. And it's saying that it will be able to counter this uh, in two ways. One, with carbon offsets, which I'm not sure if we have time to go in the detail here, uh, but you know, are, are very problematic and are certainly not any kind of reduction from the company's own production. It's like you, you're, you're purchasing essentially carbon credits. And there they talk mostly about reforestation programs and uh, uh, projects to uh, uh, improve efficiency amongst multiple farmers, these kinds of things. Um, and then you see on the on the pink line in the middle, uh, this is all about, which Bali was mentioning, uh, as emissions uh, intensity. So increasing the so-called emissions efficiency of their, their suppliers uh, who are farmers. So again, what Danone is saying here is that uh, it will uh, increase the volumes that it receives, but that these will be done in a more uh, efficient manner. And it will fall entirely onto farmers uh, to do so. And it's not clear, it's certainly not clear from Danone because there's no details about how this could be achieved, but it's not clear either from, from the available science that this is even uh, remotely a, a possibility. So you have these nice graphs and numbers, um, but no commitment to reducing growth, which is where the, the problem lies. And this is, I think, the main message we want to get out in this report is that all of these companies are committed to growth. JBS uh, just this week announced that, you know, just as the IPC was the, the, um, releasing its, its, uh, its most latest report calling for drastic uh, and far-reaching reductions and highlighting the need to reduce uh, meat and dairy production and consumption, JBS announces that it's doubling the capacity of its uh, two beef processing plants in, in Brazil. I mean, there, none of these companies are prepared to take any steps uh, to reduce growth. So that's why we are very skeptical about any kind of voluntary actions uh, that, that these companies might take and why we think that there needs to be strong measures taken to address the power of these companies because these companies use their power, they use their lobbying uh, to uh, favor policies that allow for, for that growth. And that, that's, that's the central issue here when it comes to really uh, getting at the kind of changes that are necessary. And I will just add, and I have a slide up here uh, that looks at beef emissions and emissions intensity reduction from 1960s to 2010. And I think it's a really illustrative chart that shows the limitations of technological fixes. Now, um, we're not saying that technology is not useful. Te um, technology will continue to be useful, but it's limited in its um, goal to getting to 1.5 degrees. And this is very clear from this chart because you can see that in 50 years of uh, technological improvements, efficiency improvements of mass production of, of, of livestock, uh, the blue line represents um, the, the reductions in emissions intensity through that process um, from 1961 to 2011. You can see that the major dramatic reduction is actually in beef emissions intensity of the developing world. Um, but the, the line that we need to be paying attention to is the pink line, which is just increasing like mad. And I think this is the point. Even uh, one of the examples that we use in our report is that, um, you know, Fonterra expects to be making emissions intensity reductions to the tune of 30, 40, 50%, which means actually putting that burden on farmers, right? Farmers are the ones who are supposed to do that. Um, they're supposed to invest in the technologies. They're supposed to bear the risk. Um, selling to these big companies. They're the ones who are supposed to create these emissions intensity. At the same time, these companies are continuing with their growth projections and expecting to produce more and more milk and meat. And as long as that continues, regardless of how much, um, you know, incremental reductions you have, the over, if, as long as the overall emissions continue to rise, we're not reaching our goal. And I think that's the fundamental point of our report that a, a, a transformational change needs to take place here. Just a quick um, question to clarify. Um, 
there's a there was a question about the do nothing line in Denon um, from Kelly. I don't know if you guys can just jump back one slide and just reiterate um, what that means. Yeah, I just typed something in there. This do nothing here, this yellow line is um, what uh, Denon pro is projecting that its emissions would be if it didn't take these actions to uh, increase its emissions intensity and to offset um, its emissions through uh, these uh, carbon offsetting plants. So it's, it, it's a calculation of uh, uh, the emissions from mainly from its, um, its dairy uh, processing operations and supply chain. And we say that that indicates growth because it's you know, overall, it's saying the, you know, the volume of uh, milk that it's processing increases and this is why it has increasing supply chain emissions. Hope that's clear. Okay. Um, was there anything else on the research, Chavali, that you wanted to cover? We're getting some good questions, so I hope people keep keep throwing your questions in the Q and A, and we'll get to them. Uh, we're we're going to have plenty of time for that. I think we were, I mean, we're at the halfway mark at the webinar. Um, we were going to talk about what we think needs to happen. Um, what do we see as immediate steps and longer term? But if yep. they're interesting, if you want us to go into that, we can, or we can handle that in the Q&A as, as you think. I, I think you should go ahead and um, go through what you think uh, needs to happen and, and try to kind of get through that quickly, and then we'll get to Q&A. Okay. Um, well, I mean, as, as uh, Devlin has put it uh, very clearly, we need an absolute cut in production and consumption and a transition to agroecology. Now, agroecology isn't a term that many people in the United States know. It's a global movement towards regenerative agriculture. It has its whole set of principles um, that are uh, based on food sovereignty. And I mean, we can go into that, but it's basically taking away this cookie cutter mass production approach, extractive approach that we have to livestock production and turning it into something that is regenerative, that um, is, creates agricultural resilience, that helps adapt uh, to climate change, um, and it builds soil health, and therefore, um, and with the potential of soil carbon sequestration. Now, just to be clear, that doesn't mean we're saying we should go into this whole accounting game. We're just saying this is the right thing to do for people, for agriculture, for the planet. Um, so that's that's the longer term vision. Um, uh, this is one example of what an agroecological livestock uh, farm looks like. It's a 27 acre farm in uh, Ireland, um, Western Ireland. Um, but I think immediately what can what can happen is that we have to stop incentivizing this form of production. So there's a lot of subsidies that go in to this form of production in terms of feed. Uh, in terms of uh, ignoring the externalities, uh, environmental, public health externalities. And I think, I mean, I had this picture up because the, the first fundamental step is that governments have to take this challenge seriously now. We have 10 years to turn this around for our future generations. And that means uh, it's time for action. And we have to prioritize this transition and we have to stop incentivizing methane digesters that only help large corporations capture uh, these harmful gases, but then um, also gives them money to keep expanding their operations. Um, or, uh, yeah, it's basically um, being able to, um, you know, stop generating all of these manure lagoons that now we are seeing in uh, North Carolina, what we've seen in the impact of Hurricane Florence, uh, a massive amount of, of manure um, that has spread all over the state. Um, there's just a lot of impacts that we need to come to grips with, with this industry. And so that turnaround needs to take place in the short term. And then in the medium term, we need to develop policies that actually uh, drive the transition towards the kind of agriculture we want to see. Devlin, I don't know if you want to add stuff there. 
Well, there's a really good question, I think, from uh, Marianne Cunningham. I'm seeing it's asking about, um, it says, hunger policy scholars continue to advocate the necessity of doubling food production in coming decades on assumption that the developing world will be consuming meat as in the U.S. Uh, so hunger advocates argue for the same growth as meat companies do. They want us to ask, you know, how does IPP spawn? How does Grain spawn? I think it's a very important question. I, I like how um, Greenpeace framed it. I don't think people have seen the, the Greenpeace report that came out earlier this year. They, they were talking about this notion of shrink and share. They, they were focused on consumption. So they're saying you know, consumption needs to be drastically reduced in certain countries. In other countries, consumption levels are, are fine where they are. Uh, or maybe they're they're low and could be boosted. So it's it you know depending on where you look, there there's 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 different actions that are that are required. But the idea is that you know the world has limits on how much meat and dairy we can produce and consume, and that those should be shared equ equitably. And we 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 feel the same when it comes to production. You know, every country can produce, uh, with a few exceptions, every country can produce the meat and a dairy uh, that would be required for sort of moderate levels of, of meat and dairy consumption in the country. And every country should have, uh, you know, the objective to do that. It's a way to sustain your uh, rural communities and, um, and farmers' livelihoods and uh, all kinds of knock-on on benefits. And in fact, we get into some discussion about how, and as Shafali was pointing out, you know, there are all kinds of benefits that come with keeping production more localized and at a, at a, at a, at a smaller scale. But that, that production can be shared equitably. What the industry wants to do is to have uh, this narrow vision of emissions intensity, arguing that you know, in places like the US where uh, animals are fattened and, and slaughtered at a very, uh, fattened very rapidly and slaughtered at a very young age, thereby in some ways producing uh, less emissions overall over, over a lifetime, uh, that that kind of in, in intense factory production and output uh, could then be you know, supplied to the rest of the world as a way to, to produce things efficiently. Uh, so the, you know, the, the impacts of that, not only in the communities where that factory farm uh, intensive production is happening are so, so drastic, but the impacts on the rest of the world, of course, are, are drastic as well, and, and it would have huge implications for uh, small farmers in, in developing countries. So that, you know, that is not a, a realistic uh, scenario, and we, it shouldn't be one that people are paying any attention to, but it's being used conveniently by the industry to try to avoid uh, national regulations based on country commitments uh, to, to the Paris Agreement. Um, I would also just add that, um, you know, I don't know, there's a, a debate with amongst hunger advocates as well. And I don't know which ones you're referring to, but there's plenty of advocates of food security and food sovereignty that say it's not about the production, it's about the distribution and the power. Um, and I can certainly attest to that. I mean, um, I originally come from India and spent a great deal of time working there. And in the early 2000s, there was literally uh, tons of grain being dumped into the sea while p people were starving in Orissa in a drought. And that has nothing to do with the amount of food. In fact, it has a lot to do with power, distribution, corruption, um, policies that were shoved down India's throat in terms of how to manage their grains, um, imports and exports. So it's, it's a complicated thing, but I think one thing that many people have a consensus on is, is the causes of hunger are way more complicated than the amount of food. It's, it's much more to do with power. And um, we've seen that repeatedly. We continue to produce enough food today to feed the whole planet, but we have a lot of hungry people. And that's because we're not getting at some of these issues that are driving these emissions in, in this sector as well. It's part of that same equation. Great. Um, I'm going to get to some of these questions now. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to ask you guys three questions and, in a group there, and then you can, you can answer them as you, as you will. Um, so Sarah asked, I think one of the slides seemed to indicate that emissions went down in developing countries. So that's one question. Uh, Jennifer is asking about 
uh, what kind of future research is needed to better understand what's happening in this sector? What are you seeing as the next phase of that kind of research? And Anil is asking about a uh, emissions tax on meat. And uh, what, do, what do you guys think about that as a way to try to address particularly some of these emissions intensity critiques? I don't know which one he wants to start. Um, well, in the chart, let me see if I can bring it up. Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about this chart where the emissions come down much more. And I think that's a function of the fact that um, more and more developing countries are moving towards more industrialized systems. So even though you're seeing this happen, you're still seeing this moving forward. And there's just more room to make those technological fixes in developing countries um, from where they started because the bulk of, of the emissions, um, and you should keep this in mind when you see the emissions up here. I don't know if you can see my cursor from developing countries. We still have global emissions that are well below. <laughs> so I think this chart can be misleading in the sense that uh, it, it, but it still should drive home the point that you can make these technological fixes, but until uh, you address the aggregate number of animals that are being produced and the, the more efficient you get at producing them, the faster you're, and more animals you're going to have, um, you're not going to be able to, to make up the math to get to where we want to get to for 1.5 degrees. So the short answer to why developing countries move faster is because they went from grass-fed systems, maybe much fewer animals, to much more intensified, a larger number of animals in some instances. That's probably what this chart shows. I don't know, um, Devlin, if you want to add to that. No, that's fine. Um, maybe just trying to think of some of the, the answers to the other questions. Um, on, on this question of uh, taxing meat, I, mean, I I don't have the expertise to really give a, a full assessment of that, but I, I would say that, you know, that, that can be part of the discussion. So many things have to be balanced in this. Um, if you're talking about a major reduction in, in uh, production and consumption of meat in certain countries, uh, you want to do so in a way that doesn't penalize uh, sectors of society. You want to make sure that, uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't mean that it's only affordable and uh, accessible to, to certain uh, parts of society. Uh, you also want to make sure that whatever measures are in place uh, benefit uh, rural communities, uh, farmers. Uh, so there, you know, there are there are all kinds of options that I think they're available. I know there's a question there about uh, NAFTA or the U.S. MCA of the new the new NAFTA, and I, I think that's an interesting question because. You know, in Canada, we had a, uh, well, we have uh, supply management for dairy. We have the supply management for, for other livestock products as well. Uh, and there has been, always been intense pressure from uh, the industry and from certain exporting countries to try to do away with the supply management system. And the, the idea of supply management is that you, you know, you, you have a, a level of production that is matched with consumption and you work out a decent you know, price that, that matches the cost of, that uh, allows for, for producers to make a decent livelihood uh, and that it is um, you know, accessible for, for consumers. And there is no problem in that of introducing uh, environmental considerations and health considerations. And this is something that could, uh, that should be done. Uh, but what we have with this new NAFTA is, an, is another uh, cut to the uh, supply management system, uh, which is, you know, really, uh, really injured quite badly by not only with the new, the new NAFTA agreement, but also with the, uh, the trade agreement with, with uh, the European Union and the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, so it's, you know, at a time when we should be looking to supply management as a way to try to figure out how to balance production and consumption needs in a way that can, can have the maximum societal benefits and environmental benefits. Here we are to, you know, destroying that system 
and uh, catering to the corporations who just really want to dump this excess production, whatever markets they can. Uh, Cargill always talks about it, how it does this great role of uh, you know, taking from surplus countries and, and bringing to deficit countries. Well, we don't have a deficit in Canada. This is simply about you know, trying to find another outlet for the, uh, the surplus production in the U.S., which uh, is not going to benefit uh, farmers in the U.S. That is a, a deliberate policy that has happened over the years to uh, develop this uh, uh, surplus production um, as a way to, to, to meet the needs of the, of the dairy industry, the dairy corporations. It doesn't, it doesn't go to help farmers. I know both Ben and, and Shafali can, can speak well to that. Um, and then the other question uh, that was sort of part of that group is, is uh, research. Um, what are you guys seeing as follow-up research to this kind of initial assessment of the meat industry's role in climate change? Um, there's a lot more to do, but I also think we, we need to do an assessment, and this is something I'm realizing. Um, you know, IATP has been part of a, a joint uh, report that's coming out next week in response to the IPCC 1.5 degree report, um, talking about how we get to 1.5 degrees, respecting rights and, and planetary boundaries. And one of the things that we found as part of doing that report is seeing the bias in the science towards uh, quantifying emissions intensity reductions towards researching the technological fixes, but not enough emphasis going into researching uh, and documenting and showing how agroecological models, how um, these kinds of agricultural, regenerative agricultural models can contribute to that 1.5 degree pathway. There are studies and we quote them, but there's in terms of the resources that the industry or the governments are directing towards industry solutions is far more than the research that's going towards the kind of uh, agriculture we see that's going to create the resilience and the transition that we need. Um, so I think that's one really key area that needs to be in the forefront. Much more publicly funded money needs to support these initiatives. And there's lots of documentation about agroecology and s small farms that are that are producing more, that are regenerating, that are bringing back biodiversity. But I think we really need to show um, uh, the scientific community, the policy community, that there's a science to back it up. Um, I don't know what else. I, I think there's much more to be done in terms of follow up and monitoring of what these uh, companies are doing and how they're responding. Uh, so it's much more of a real time kind of saying, here's what they're saying, here's what we see they're doing. Um, and does this add up? It's just to continue to bring to the fore uh, how far off the mark we are and how much of a contribution this industry plays to this problem. Devlin? No, I think, I think you've captured it well. Okay, I'm going to throw in uh, another round of questions. So we got, I think, sort of generally grouped into three, uh, three questions. One is kind of very specific from Hannah, uh, who um, understands from some of the recent literature that livestock animals treated with antibiotics may produce higher levels of emissions. So she's wondering if you had heard that, what you think about that. Uh, Amy is asking about what about veganic or veganic? I'm not sure about that. I'm not familiar with that term, but I think I know what it means. Vegan um, question as a response. And then Jeannie kind of putting that together asks about uh, meat manufactured in a lab replacing industrial animal ag. Um, what do you think about that as an option going forward? And then uh, and then finally, Tristan is asking about the challenges of political messaging to get people to embrace the idea of consuming less, uh, less meat in this particular case. You know, it, it, what is, do people have a ready option in the case of energy that seems like um, they do have an option in terms of renewable energy? How, how, what do you see as some of the challenges in talking about this in the meat sector? 
I don't know, uh, maybe Devlin, you, maybe you can take on one of those questions first. Uh, yeah, I, 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 unfortunately, I don't have any information about uh, the connection between antibiotics and emissions, so I can't speak to that. Um, now, there has been a lot of hype about this uh, lab, lab meat uh, recently, and you even have some of the meat companies so through their, their venture fund arms um, making some investments, and that tends to get a lot of headlines. Uh, if, if I, it's an area that we'd like to understand more, but uh, I think for now, it would be safe to say, so just certainly wouldn't want that to distract from changes that are needed within the livestock industry. It's, I mean, it's, um, you know, that, that this is uh, you know, something there, it's something on the horizon. It's good to understand who the actors are. It's good to understand what the full emissions are and environmental impacts of this. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly wouldn't want it to distract from, uh, you know, we wouldn't want it to be seen as some kind of techno fix that just distracts from the real policy and political issues uh, that are on the table. Um, and then, you know, this question about messaging, um, I mean, part of the reason uh, we, we, we did take up this work on meat and dairy is, is we, we think it is an actual, a, a fairly straightforward area uh, in some ways, for for action, um, sometimes it's it's difficult to deal uh, with, with system change and understanding how you can engage with that. But with meat and dairy, I mean, there are there are actions that you you can take. Uh, there's some that are being taken on a, a local level. You know, when it comes to uh, say schools uh, sourcing their, their 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 foods for the cafeteria more locally. Uh, or even when it comes to individuals who are looking to make uh, dietary dietary changes, and I think some of the messages that I've seen, anyways, coming up from the media on the IPCC report is, you know, meat and dairy are are, are up there in the, in the recommendations and, and and changing your diet. So I think it's important for mm -hmm. for people to understand how much um, you know, of climate change is due to our our food system. Not just meat and dairy, but uh, lots of the emissions are coming from uh, other parts of the of the food system, and particularly from the, the industrial food system. So, how can we make dietary changes? How can we push for for food system change? That can happen at the local level, which gives us lots of tools for action. Um, and I just put up this uh, this beautiful image for, I guess, this big march that just took place in uh, Rise for Climate in, on, in September. And just some of those images are striking because I feel like, um, you know, one of, one of the responses about consuming less and the transition to agroecology uh, and even thinking about lab meat is, is about, um, you know, what is millions of people in the world depend on agriculture still. So while meat lab, lab meat might be an option for folks who are, you know, who are mainly consumers and might be able to pay whatever price uh, that these companies pick, I think for me, a central question about lab meat is who's going to control that production. And it's the same question that we have about, uh, it's the same problem that we're facing with the food system today. Who's, who's, who controls the production? Who controls the exports? Um, I think there's a comment in, uh, by somebody in this webinar that's talking about, you know, looking at imports and exports. And, uh, and it's true, consuming less is essential. Uh, looking at vegan and vegetarian options is, is important because we have to d dramatically cut down our meat intake. But the fact remains that there are millions of people still dependent on livestock and still dependent on, on agriculture around the world. And that there are producers who are trying to do the right thing with animals, with the environment, with biodiversity. And, um, and so there has to be kind of a convergence of different movements that come together. Uh, that's not just looking at consumption, but looking at citizen action. And it's looking at how do we get at some of these structural problems of who controls the production and who controls the exports. Um, are countries 
uh, able to decide and define their food security policy without having trade uh, institutions dictate to them uh, how much they need to be exporting or becoming import dependent, for instance. Um, and I think for the lab meat question, that, that would be my question is, is, is this technology going to be proprietary? Who's going to control it? Who's going to benefit from it? I think we, I think the jury's still out on that. Um, but the bottom line is, even though some of these companies are starting to invest in this stuff, they still have plans to expand their production in meat and dairy. And I don't see that shifting in this 10 year time horizon, 20 year time horizon that we wanna make a dramatic transition away from this model. And Devlin and I were talking before this webinar to say, do we think that these companies are gonna do this by themselves? No, we don't think that. Of course we don't think that. Um, it's the job of our governments and this has to become a key mobilizing issue, I think, in the very near future. We have to strongly demand regulations and strongly demand a transition plan out of this. Um, I think our intention behind this report was to really put it out front to show you, look, this is a sector and an industry that really is crying out for attention and it's time. And Tristan, to you about, you know, the alternatives and the transition. I mean, we've been calling for this transition and, and you and many other groups around the world, this transition to agroecology. Many people in the West don't know what agroecology is. And I think that will come once we once citizens can mobilize to see that this is a problem then the solutions that are already there i think will become much more clear and i think that has been a lesson from the fossil free and the coal movements that once people really started to recognize look these guys are the bad guys we need to get away from it i think then people started paying attention to solar and wind solar and wind was there before um, and i think there's a lot we in the agriculture and food movement can learn from the climate movement. All right, let's keep moving here. I wanna to get to as many, we're getting very good questions, so keep sending them in. Um, I, I, Hannah, I guess we don't, don't have an answer to you, for you on the antibiotic question, but that's interesting, and so um, be interested to learn more about that. So Natalie asks about uh, setting up a court case. Has, has there been any thoughts about that or exploring that like a Dutch court decision on climate? I'm not, I'm familiar with that, but maybe you guys are. Um, and then we have a question about um, could these companies, let's see, what do you think is the role of the companies themselves? These corporations are having such an impact on greenhouse gas emissions. Do you think that they could have a role going forward as being part of the solution? Or are the companies, I guess the underlying question, are the companies themselves kind of the problem? Um, or could they be part of the solution? Uh, and then Jordan is asking about uh, how the upcoming reform of the common agricultural policy in the EU and CAP, um, could it impact EU meat and dairy emissions? So why don't we tackle those kind of three questions to the extent that you guys can. Um, which one of you wants to go first? Well, I can start if that's okay. Uh, well, I think the Dutch case is really interesting. I haven't, I haven't looked too much in detail at, at, the, at the verdict and what it means, but I mean, the Netherlands is, an, is a major producer and exporter of, uh, of dairy and livestock. So it'd be interesting to see what that means for, uh, for that, that production. Um, as far as cases directly as targeting companies, uh, within the dairy industry, I'm not aware of any, but I mean, of course, these are all interesting avenues to explore. Um, as to the question about the role of companies, I think, you know, for us, the, the, the takeaway message in looking at what these companies are doing and how they are retaining their commitments to, to growth is that the actions that are necessary are diametrically opposed to their interests. So, as we take action or as we push for action, we're going to get pushback from these companies. It's the same thing with the fossil fuel companies. You know, they are mobilizing to try to undermine real action on climate change. And I would expect the same from the meat and dairy companies. So that I would, I would focus more on that than trying to, to, to assess what kind of uh, you know, positive contributions they, they might be able to, to make. 
Um, and then the final question about CAP. Uh, I, again, it's not an area that I know too well in detail. I'm sure there are other people on, on this uh, webinar who know it much, much better than I do. Um, but we're already seeing some impacts of this. Uh, you know, if you uh, talking to my African colleagues and organizations, they're pointing out that we're already starting to see more dumping of milk powder from the EU uh, into to Africa because they're looking for places to put this the surplus that's generated from the from taking away the quotas. Uh, places that they can dump the surplus. And so what it means in, in Africa, not only that it undermines local production, which in itself is a huge problem, but it increases the consumption of processed food products, unhealthy processed food products made with this, uh, you know, ultra processed uh, uh, dairy based raw materials. So you get you know, this, uh, all kinds of these Nestle products now being uh, being dumped into into countries like uh, Senegal, uh, and that in it that itself is, is is a big problem. And Nestle, you know, of course, we will we'll talk along about its uh, commitments to sustainability, uh, but the two don't go together. So you know, I, I I can say from what we're seeing already from uh, what's happening in the EU that uh, this is, this is a major problem. And of course, the EU is going around the world signing agreements with different countries to get more access to markets for for its uh, its meat and dairy sectors and also uh, uh, increasing the access that, that, that these same companies have to the EU market so there's there's you know the removing of all kind of constraints and controls at a time when that's exactly what we need Oh, we're, we're really getting a lot of questions that I wish we could go on a little bit longer, but we're going to try to squeeze in a few more here and then we're going to have to end, but, but can hopefully I just, keep this conversation can I, going. Can I just quickly come in on the cap and then we can go on, but um, oh, okay. so, just one second, which is, I think f the cap, the biggest thing is the incentives that are given to the largest farms versus the smaller producers. And it's very clear that the cap is rigged towards the largest producers. So that doesn't help. Um, the other thing is to see that in the upcoming reform, will there be money diverted towards um, shifting agricultural practices that are actually agri that are resilient rather than the chemically dependent in industrial ag practices? And I think that's that's where the link comes in most clearly. And that's obviously what people need to be pushing for. And that's the big message. What, was that gonna happen? It's highly unlikely, but I think you can raise public awareness and mobilize people towards that to push the EU in that direction. Great, I mean, we're gonna do two final questions here. Uh, one uh, is, has there been research that looks at the amount of emissions, I think from this sector due to imports and exports? So. Uh, there was recent research about the uh, what they call offshoring of emissions, but uh, I think in the fossil fuel industry. But has there been similar research? I think looking at the meat and dairy industry specifically around imports and exports. And then another question uh, around uh, basically from Sam saying most land use change in South America is for livestock. What opportunities do you see for the COP 2019? that will be on land use. So tackling some of these larger land use issues, are you seeing opportunities within the COP, um, the upcoming COPs to address that? Who wants to take either of those questions? Um, I think the short answer for the import exports is that I haven't seen any um, quantification of imports and exports, but I think what our report does is provide a methodology to be able to do it. Um, you know, you have to look at, and, I, and there are probably different ways of doing it, but you have to look at the emissions factors for the different livestock products and the regions and apply that and then maybe apply it to imports and exports. So it's, 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 I think we've provided a way to do it. I don't think I've seen it. I don't know, Devlin, if you've seen it. No, it would be great, though, if people want to look, say, at a particular trade agreement and try to make an assessment of what that means in terms of increased emissions from uh, from increased uh, meat and dairy exports and imports and production. Um, in terms of the, the COP um, coming up in Poland and next year, I mean, I think it's a huge mobilizing opportunity next year, especially if it's in Brazil. Uh, 
to around land use, it's true. There's been dramatic changes and ongoing still, as long as the appetite for exports continues in South in Latin America, um, there will continue to be dramatic changes. Um, and I think that, I mean, as we're witnessing in the United States with one hurricane after another, we're going to be seeing a lot of climate related events that are dramatic, unfortunately, um, very destructive and costly and, um, and so I think all of these, I hope, are mobilizing forces and, and the COP will be an important mobilizing force. And the question I think really is for all of us to see how can we get our governments to no longer put their heads in the sand and really take action on these issues. Yeah, and just to add, I mean, <laughs> the current situation in Brazil uh, really helps to highlight how much of this is about, cannot be divorced from po the political situation. Um, you know, the, uh, the agribusiness lobby in Brazil has uh, essentially been deeply strengthened by the coup and by the, um, the potential election of the far right. So, uh, you know, transformation needs to happen at all levels, but it cannot be separated from the political context. Very good. Okay, so just a reminder, we will send out a recording of this webinar to all participants. We'll post it on our website. Copies of the report are available on Green's website, Emissions of Possible, and IETP's website. Um, and feel free to reach out to any of us if you have additional questions or thoughts. Um, thanks for the great discussion, great questions, and um, thanks very much for your participation. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Of course. <laughs>